Hello everyone, uh, my name is Sam Kossel, I'm an amateur theoretical physicist and the last five months I've been working on a theory uh, of quantum gravity, trying to unify gravity with the electrostatic forces, the forces generated by electrons. Um, the reason I started to do this is partly in response to something I said to my flatmate one morning. I said, should I, what should I do today? Should I transcend the ego and become the Buddha or should I unify gravity and quantum mechanics? She took it a little bit too seriously, a little bit more seriously than I meant. So, um, yeah, I guess this is kind of revenge. But this is mostly in response to something I read in a book of Richard Feynman's uh, Character of Physical Law, uh, where he mentioned the ratio between gravitational attraction and electrical repulsion, which is quite well known. It's 4.17 to the center of 42. And because 42 is involved potentially in the theory of everything, uh, I couldn't resist, so I had to do it. Uh, right, so, get ready, this is my theory of quantum gravity. Uh, sit back, relax, don't panic, and let's get stuck in. So, the idea starts with, uh, all, uh, all atoms have a probability density of electrons surrounding them. Uh, I.e. the area where you're most likely to find an electron around an atom. Um, so I built this idea that uh, whilst an electron is almost certainly at this point of high probability density around an atom, which for a hydrogen atom in its ground state is the 4 radius, which is approximately 0.053 nanometers away from the atomic nucleus, um, there's also potentially an area outside this area of high probability, which I'm going to call the secondary probability density, where you might also find an electron if it interacts with something there. Um, but obviously there's a much lower probability of that happening as the probability diminishes exponentially past the four radius for a hydrogen atom. So because this uh, theory, uh, theory of atoms, it can then be extrapolated to anything made of atoms. Because it involves electrons, um, it will provide a good reason for gravity being proportional to mass because the number of electrons in something is usually proportional to the mass of that object. So we're treating large objects such as planets, stars, galaxies, as having both the primary and the secondary electron density. Uh, the secondary density in the case, in this case, being analogous to the uh, <coughs> gravitational field of the object uh, and the field of electrons. The way you find the number of electrons in the secondary density of the planet for a time differential of 100 nanoseconds is you multiply the average atomic number, which in the case of the Earth is 16, by the number of atoms in the Earth, which is 5.54 times 10 to the 51, and you then divide by this ratio between gravity and the electrostatic forces, 4.17 times 10 to the 42 which yields the number 2.4 times 10 to the 7 for a time differential. If you then want to find the number of, ele of electrons which uh, appear around you over more recognizable periods of time, such as a second, uh, you then divide uh, uh, one second by a time differential, which is about 0.1 uh, to the minus 7, which is then 2.4 times 10 to the 17. So that's lots of electrons, basically. Uh, I did um, a calculation per cubic meter per second for electrons. Uh, that turned out to be about 2 billion electrons per cubic meter per second, which, uh, if you then add in all the electrons from the sun, the rest of the galaxy, uh, does add up to quite a substantial number of electrons. There are another of um, other reasons uh, for thinking that this might be a good idea. For one thing, it explains um, all of the classic tests of general relativity. Uh, we'll start with the redshift. Um, between galaxies, there are electrons in the secondary density of the entire universe, which are comparatively starved of incoming radiation, I meaning they're of a comparatively low energy. <coughs> so they're more likely to uh, absorb blue-shifted photons than they are to absorb red-shifted photons. So if for a galaxy moving away in deep space, uh, the electrons in between 
like galaxies ourselves, be receiving uh, a less and less amount of radiation, which means they'd be absorbing a higher and higher amount of the blue shifted photons coming from those galaxies, which would then be emitting red shifted photons as the incoming blue photons come in. Uh, for a galaxy moving towards us, such as Andromeda, uh, the light from Andromeda will be hitting the secondary probability density surrounding our galaxy, uh, which means that it will be kicking out more and more blue shifted photons and absorbing more and more red shifted photons because of uh, conservation of energy. That's basically how that would work. The second test is the reflected capacity of stars. Which are stars seeing as they are in this model at least surrounded by a cloud of electrons, they would be absorbing and emitting photons all the time via quantum electrodynamics. Uh, and then that would account for their partial reflection of their reflective capacity. Uh, the third test is well, the third thing I'm going to talk about is the perihelion precession of Mercury in this model. Um, so Mercury is surrounded by electrons, as everything is in this idea, uh, but it has no angular momentum, so therefore it's more liable to be under the influence of the gravity of the other planets in the solar system, meaning that it shifts every so often on its orbit uh, because of the gravity of the other planets. Uh, this is also an interesting explanation for dark matter, by the way because um, almost all bodies in the galaxy rotate, and when they rotate, the electrons bump into the electrons from other objects, and they create electrical resistance between them. This isn't exactly the sort of electrical resistance that physicists usually deal with, but there's a resistance generated there which isn't explained by Einstein's theory of general relativity and the curvature of space-time alone. So um, I think that may be a valid idea as well. Uh, as for the gravitational lensing, um, surrounded by electrons, very simply, photons come in, they're absorbed by an electron, electron absorbs another one, and so on around the planet in a sort of jagged pattern, which I've illustrated here. Uh, what else? Time dilation. This is one which I really, really love. Because um, all of this is taking place, this isn't in a, uh, a Minkowski space, if that means anything to my body. This is saying that. Uh, space-time itself isn't quantizable, that it's, um, it, this is just empty space, and the, the effects of general relativity in terms of time dilation and so on are caused by the electron density of objects. So you have an object that's moving, say it's a GPS satellite, and it's moving around the Earth, the clock's ticking faster on the GPS satellite than the clock's are on the Earth, so we have GPS, uh, because it's an atomic clock, the electron is moving faster between because it's encountered less resistance from electrons in the probability density of the Earth. It's also account for why the clocks on the space shuttle uh, move at a slower rate, because they're moving at uh, higher velocity, they're moving through more electrons on average than uh, the GPS satellite would be, clocks on the Earth would be. Um, another thing, if you go towards the speed of light, um, you will reach a point of saturation where everything slows down to uh, a complete stop because everything is being surrounded by these secondary density electrons. Um, so this goes from anything from the strands of RNA coding for proteins along DNA strands in the atomic cell nuclei to uh, clocks to movements to uh, metabolization of glucose in your body, everything slows down to zero when you reach the speed of light. Uh, the other thing that needs to be explained is the prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity is gravitational waves. Uh, this sounds a bit like, you know, this is where it gets all the it button maybe and uh, the idea, but it's an idea that I particularly like is that photons have mass and I think that by Einstein's theory of general relativity it would be unusual if it didn't have mass. Uh, because E equals mg squared, energy is equal to the mass and the square of light speed, which implies that mass is energy and energy is mass in a different form. By this, it would also be very hard for a photon to have an energy in terms of general relativity in the first place if it didn't also have a mass, a 
associated with that energy would be very high loss of Venus of mass energy equivalents. If photons didn't have mass, this is probably already very well understood. But, uh, but what the mass of the photon would be, I think, would have to fall in a range of Planck's constant. Um, I'm using a range determined by the uncertainty principle, which I also governs their the phenomena of their wavelength. Uh, the unit of Planck's constant using the uncertainty principle is h bar divided by 2, h bar being obviously h by 2 pi, so h bar divided by 2, and h. So the lower mass bound for the photon, so this would be, I would suppose, gamma radiation, that would be the mass energy equivalence of h bar divided by 2, and the higher limit would be h, which would be uh, radio waves, I suppose, on the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this would be the mass gap for the Yang Mills theory, but um, it would have the not particularly great side effect of breaking the gauge invariants, which, um, seeing as they, seeing as the mass is very, I mean, it would be pretty high for the gauge theory, which is invariant under any number of local transformations, seeing as they have different mass energies, I suppose. So, the theory of gravitational waves is that when two black holes collide with one another, seeing as the universe is, is full of all sorts of radiation, the CMB, visible light, radio waves, x-rays, whatever, um, these black holes colliding create enough kinetic energy to, that kinetic energy to be dissipated into the radiation itself, as it has mass. And the light over text is being picked this up. Whilst they manage to um, filter out all sorts of interference, they haven't managed to sort of filter out a large amount of the cosmic radiation latent in space itself. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, dark energy. Yeah. Um, my idea of dark energy is also related to uh, photons having mass. And it's also related to the idea of a chameleon particle. A uh, chameleon particle is a particle that. Um, as the name suggests, hides itself, which is what would be happening here. But, um, between galaxies, areas of high concentration of massive photons build up where they create classical superpositions with one another, and uh, there's a limit to how large the superpositions, superpositions can grow before, though, before they start to break entirely. And when they break, they cause expansion. And because of the reflective capacity of galaxies and the amount of radiation they emit are more or less constant, it creates an exponential growth function, possibly, in um, how fast the galaxies move away from each other, or rather how fast the space between the galaxies expands, um, which would account for the accelerating expansion of the universe, it's not just and it's accelerating. Um, so that's more or less it. Oh yeah, that's it. I have to clean up a few things which um, may be wrong. Um, the main problem is that the electron densities of atoms are governed by the Dirac equations and more recently the relativistic Klein-Gordon equations. I think the problem is those equations in the first place are that they're relativistic and they include space-time vectors which may in some way uh, prevent my idea from working. Um, but I don't know, I thought this was a nice idea anyway. Um, it's most likely incorrect. Uh, Phil Moriarty of Nottingham the other day sent me some emails saying quite conclusively why it was incorrect. And some other people on the Stack Exchange, uh, if anyone can remember, off the top of my head, Lemon, uh, did some calculations to, uh, about the probability densities of electrons and why this is very unlikely, as in very, very unlikely to be the case. Uh, so you can check all this out on the blog, zerqbible.wordpress.com, and yeah, thanks for your time.